Dude, what? I don't want to be a part of this, man. Grow up. Do your f***ing video. That's not very Mabel-like of you. Why am I Mabel? <sighs> I'm doing Gravity Falls. Hey everybody, Fat Man here, and I am so, so very excited to finally talk about the masterpiece that is Gravity Falls. Debuting in June of 2012 and wrapping up in February of 2016, Gravity Falls was created by Alex Hirsch and ran for two 20-episode seasons. Another graduate from the California Institute of the Arts, Hirsch got a start working around Pendleton Ward, the creator of Adventure Time, where he worked as a writer and storyboard artist on The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack and... Wow, this sounds really familiar if you've seen the last video. No wonder I fell in love with both of these shows. Hirsch is an absolute genius in many ways, and it's on full display throughout Gravity Falls' run. He pays careful attention to detail in everything he does, from the writing to the storyboarding. Even his care with telling an overarching story is unmatched by almost anything I've seen in the last 10 years. Hirsch also specifically chose to end the show after two seasons, stating that the show isn't being cancelled, it's being finished. Which was a really smart call on his behalf as he had already told the story, and Gravity Falls made a boatload of money for Disney so it could have easily ran for a third if he wanted it to. Since this is a little bit of a shorter series than anything else I've reviewed on this channel, this will be less of a full look at the episodes as they span their respective seasons, and more of a dive into the wonderful characters, the gut-busting humor, and the absolute insanity that surrounds this small town in Oregon. Gravity Falls, much like regular show, was a series that I saw way after its run and fell madly in love with. Again, for some background, the younger brother I talked about in the regular show video was also responsible for introducing me to this show, and... Man, between the introduction of Gravity Falls, regular show, and Phineas and Ferb, I might need to go out and buy this kid a gift or something. He is three for three here. I love all of these shows. The series takes off with twin siblings Dipper and Mabel Pines being sent to the town of Gravity Falls to live with their gruncle, or great uncle Stan, for the summer. He runs the local Mystery Shack, a tourist trap centered in town along with Handyman Seuss and... Cashier Stock Person Wendy? Hey, Wendy didn't care enough to define her job title, so neither will I. The town is immediately revealed to be a den of mysteries and supernatural goings-on, and this fact is confirmed by Dipper when he finds a mysterious journal written by an unknown author. I really adore this setup, and the series sets the mystery up very well going into Season 1, giving little glimpses and ending stingers, without diving full-on into it, allowing the viewer to kind of really settle into this town and get to know these great characters. Speaking of, let's give props right now because this show nails every single character. Every one of them. They are such a lovable and charming cast that if somebody tells me they dislike a character, I think that you're actively trying to dislike that character. Kristen Schaal is an absolute delight as Mabel, doing a really successful job of bringing her goofy and fun-loving attributes to the forefront. Jason Ritter does so well as selling Dipper as this nervous, but brave and curious kid right on the edge of his sanity trying to figure out the mysteries of this town. Alex Hirsch, God bless Alex Hirsch, pulls a hat trick speaking on behalf of Seuss, Grunkle Stan, and Bill Cipher. More on him later. It's such an impressive feat as all these characters are not only radically different from each other personality-wise, but voice-wise as well. They don't sound all that similar to each other. I will go on record right now, you have this as proof, and say that Grunkle Stan is one of the best Disney characters of all time. I am not joking. Think about their lineup of impressive and classic and memorable characters throughout all of these years, and if I was making a top 20 best Disney characters list, you better believe I would put Grunkle Stan on there. Note to self, video idea for top 20 Disney characters. That's gonna put butts in chairs. You like Disney characters so much? Yeah. Go on, name 20 of them. Alright, <laughs> ready? Simba, 
Nala, Rafiki, Mufasa, Timon, Pumba, Scar, Shenzi, Benzi, Ed, Aladdin, Genie, Jasmine, Abu, Sultan, the Magic Carpet, Jafar, Iago, Oliver, and Stitch. There's 20. Frank, you. You honestly could have named like several thoughts on that. <laughs> That's good, because the first like 12 were from the same movie. Moving on, I have a serious question for you guys. Has Linda Cardellini literally ever done a bad job of voicing a character? Ever? Watching regular show and this back to back, when Wendy first spoke, I immediately heard CJ and knew right then and there that this character was in great hands. We love you, Linda. The series also does a very good job at being subtle. Watching the first two episodes, Taurus Trapped and The Legend of the Gobblewonker, you'd think nothing of Gravity Falls outside of it being a silly children's show with some neat animation. However, really sitting down and giving this a go, we start to see the overarching story, and it's brilliant. The paranormal starts creeping in, and by episode 4, The Hand That Rocks the Mabel, we're really beginning to see that everything is not as it seems. And that Dipper isn't just some paranoid, neurotic kid. But that something is actually the heck wrong with this town. I would also like to point to two pretty important characters that we meet very early on in this first batch of episodes. Fiddleford McGucket! Also voiced by Hirsch, Jesus, this guy. And Gideon Gleeful, voiced by Flapjack himself. Can I check my script for a sec? I am gonna butcher this guy's name. Therop Van Orman. If for whatever reason you are watching this, I'm sorry, that is the best I can do. McGucket comes into play a little later on, but Gideon, from his introduction until the closing minutes of the series, is absolutely delightful and hilarious. He becomes an antagonist to the Pines twins, bearing an unrequited crush on Mabel, and wanting to rob Dipper of his journal, as Gideon also possesses a journal. I've heard Gideon Detractor say that he's too silly at times or he tries to be too serious at other times and shouldn't be taken that seriously but to that i say well good for you you're wrong uh a he's not the main villain and b gideon is undeniably hilarious and convincingly threatening when he needs to be watch this show again if you don't see that seriously listen to some of this and tell me you don't love this kid You've just made the biggest mistake of your life! Yeah. Gideon Charles Gleeful, clean up your room this instant! I can buy and sell you, old man! Fair enough. Oh, howdy, Stanford! Listen closely. Inside this jar have 1,000 cursed Egyptian super termites. Hand over the deed to your property or I'll smash this jar with a bat and they'll devour this shack with you inside. Hey, what's that? Huh? <laughs> oh, no! Get it all! Hey, Seuss, get in here. I want to take pictures of this. Y'all may have won the battle, but mark my words, Stanford. Your family has a weak spot and I'm gonna find it! Ah! Not to mention, I I always got a kick out of his dad, Bud, being voiced by Stefan Root, because I always imagined some kind of weird alternate reality where Bill Dotrieve leaves Arlen and kidnaps Flapjack and goes to live with him. And as I said before, the show really starts ramping things up with the introduction of Gideon. We learn that this unknown author penned multiple journals, and Gideon isn't just after Dipper and Mabel, but he's after the Mystery Shack as well. We reveal that Grunkle Stan originally played off as kind of an oafish miser, might know more than he's let on as well, revealing a secret room under the mystery shack hidden behind the vending machine. We meet Sheriff Blubs and Deputy Durland. And look, I, I wish I could sit here all day and just play hilarious clips every single time I wanted to talk about a character. But then I'd sit here all day and never actually get to the review, so take my word for it when I tell you that these two are far and away the best relationship in the show. Kevin Michael Richardson and Keith Ferguson do an immaculate job of selling these two. So much so that I almost want a prequel series on these guys. How did they meet? Who the hell let them take an evaluation and become police? I want answers. Even background characters like Candy and Grenda have a lot of thought put into them. By the way, 
something tells me that a character like Grenda might attract some controversy in this day and age, but it, it just makes me love her more. <laughs> I, I'm These are legitimate laughs, by the way. Like, every time I mention a character, I'm thinking about some of the material. I'm like, Gravity, Show, Gravity Falls is f***ing funny. And Grenda's awesome, because she's, like, just some dumpy fat chick who sounds like a dude, and, like, I don't know, it just works so well. Like, you see this cute little character animated, then she comes up, and she's like, Yeah! Grenda's time to fight! <laughs> like, she's, she's closer to, like, uh, she reminds me of, like, Murray from Sly Cooper or something. I don't know why, I just, <laughs> like, if Murray had a human daughter, it would be Grenda. And, and that's amazing to me. I love it. <laughs> Well, you know, this day and age, they drone. It's a metaphor for being trans. No, it's not. <laughs> off. Much props to Nikki Yang and Carl. I'm checking the script again. These guys' names escape me. Carl. Faruolo. I am so sorry, guy. I, I have no idea how to pronounce that. But props to them for taking a very small role and filling it with charm and personality. These two are so funny, I legitimately have laughed at some of their antics until it hurt. Grenda is hilarious. Speaking of that, that is another thing I want to hint on. Gravity Falls is funny. I mean really funny. Not funny for a kid's show, not funny for a Disney show, not funny for what it is. This show is just really, really funny. I'd even say hilarious. There are several moments per episode that got an audible laugh out of me while I was watching this. All right, this is the last clip show, I promise, but here. I would like to see you settled before I ascend to heaven and live with the angels. And with Grandpa. No, he is not there. Movies are great. You watch the movie, you scare the girl, the girl snuggles up next to you. Next thing you know, you gotta raise a kid, your life falls apart. Forget that last part. This room is way creepy. Not as creepy as Dipper's internet history. Hey! <gasps> Mabel, I don't have time for your games. If you don't give me those supplies, I'll lose the coolest job ever. Oh, I understand. Hey, look! Wendy in a bikini! Really? At night? Sorry, Dipper! <laughs> Took an hour to think of this, but it was worth it. Ha! Get out of here! <laughs> you salt-licking, horn-swaggling! McSuck it! They got me good! It's not just the dialogue written for them. Every actor or actress here is just nailing the delivery, which is like half the battle when you're trying to make somebody laugh. Especially Hirsch, Shawl, and Van Orman. Everybody knocks it out of the park, but these guys are leading the pack. The visual gags are bright and funny as well. They really lend themselves to the show, which is generally very well animated. There's always something creative and eye-catching going on, whether in the background or in the foreground. Everything in Gravity Falls works so well in tandem, and I think that's why I love this show so much. The writing complements the voice actors, which complement the characters, which complement the humor, which complements the setting, which complements the visuals. It's like a never-ending cycle of perfection, and this just works. All of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding. Now, I, I've talked about the humor, and I've given the story a little bit of attention, but now let's talk about Gravity Falls' bread and butter. The paranormal and supernatural stuff is done so remarkably well, and what I adore about it is that it can be absolutely ridiculous. Please see garden gnomes disguised as a zombie, a herd of man -ators, and a multi-bear. Or Mermondo the Merman. Or it can be bat insane. They go hard when they try to ramp up the danger and the stakes. And they introduce authentically scary material. Hell, I'm an adult and I can fully admit to the Summerween monster being absolutely terrifying. That's why I love Gravity Falls so much though. Take something as mind-bogglingly ridiculous as the premise of Summerween, yes, it is exactly what you think it is, and then pair it with the Summerween trickster. The Krampus-like monster hunting the kids throughout the episode. Throughout the entire run of the series, Gravity Falls retains this, like, peanut butter chocolate mix with this kind of stuff very well. It's not out of left field for 
them to do something kind of zany and weird, followed up by something that is actually horrific. The first season of the show is bright, entertaining, and consistently creative, with the humble beginnings of an intriguing mystery weaving back and forth at all times. The characters are lovable, the humor is quick-witted, and the stakes are just high enough to keep the viewers invested without ever feeling like they're too dire. Then the two-part season finale happens and gets real once we introduce Bill mother flippin' Cypher, who, my god, is phenomenal. I cannot describe him as anything less than that. When Bill first arrived after being summoned by Gideon, I'll admit, I was a little worried. I like his design and his demeanor, but I could tell that the writers were setting Bill up to be the main villain of the series. I just wasn't sure initially if Bill could have that effect. Would he carry the Disney plague and be overly jokey and rob every scene he was in of its tension? Or would he be one-dimensional and have no personality outside of evil bad guy McBaddington? I doubted Bill Cipher. That was wrong. So horribly, horribly wrong. Gravity Falls shut me the hell up and God, why can't more shows step up and prove me wrong? Bill is character writing and character development at its absolute best. He's a manipulative, conniving jerk who toys with our protagonists. And it is made unarguably clear that Bill hands them the win in his debut episode. The problem with any form of media that introduces a villain that has ultimate power is that the power is usually underutilized, unexplained, or set up so one-sidedly against our heroes that it feels unbelievable when they win. This is the setup we get with Bill initially. There is no feasible way that the Pines twins can defeat him as they are now in their current state of the series, so why bother acting like they got a real victory over him? That would undermine Bill as a character. If he's such a raging badass, how can two kids who are just getting introduced to this world of phenomenon possibly beat him? The answer is they can't. And the show knows this, and it highlights this with a clever and believable solution. As it does again at the end of the series when they eventually clash with Bill. Again, Bill's maniacal, he's unhinged, he's deadly, he's aggressive, he's threatening. And at the same time, he retains humor and sarcasm that falls right in line with the show thematically. So it never feels out of place or random. Bill Cipher, in essence, is a perfect character. In his debut episode, Dreamscaper sees Gideon summoning Bill in an effort to retrieve a code from Stan's safe, which holds the deed to the mystery shack. Bill agrees and enters Stan's mind to retrieve the code, with Mabel, Dipper, and Seuss in hot pursuit. The trio is able to remove Bill from Stan's mind, but not quickly enough, as Gideon has succeeded in stealing the deed. Gideon rises, sees Gideon plotting to turn the mystery shack into a sort of amusement park, all paying tribute to himself. The true nature of the journals is finally revealed and they are told to hold an unimaginable power when all of them are gathered together. Failing to realize that there are three journals, not two, Gideon analyzes maps and codes to deduce that the final journal must be hiding inside the mystery shack. An epic final battle takes place in the Gideon bot where Dipper finally defeats Gideon, who winds up getting carted away to jail. Dipper finally trusts Stan enough to reveal the journals to him, and Stan just laughs them off as nonsense and confiscates the books. In the closing scene of the episode, we see Stan in a secret room under the mystery shack, revealing that he had actually had the final journal all along. The three journals put together reveal a map and an access code for a hidden portal inside the room. As Stan activates the device, he exclaims, Here we go! as Season 1 comes to a close. What Season 1 did well, Season 2 just amplifies times 50. Every single aspect of Gravity Falls just grows stronger. From the writing and the humor, to the character development and arcs, everything's here in spades. The first third of the episodes focuses on Dipper, Mabel, Wendy, and Seuss trying to uncover the identity of the author of the journals, while Grunkle Stan continues to focus on trying to activate the portal. 
Things finally come to a head in the episode Not What He Seems, when, tracing a batch of stolen nuclear waste that Stan uses to power the portal, federal agents arrive to arrest Stan as he sets a countdown timer of 18 hours on the portal. This episode does a wonderful job of sowing doubt between Stan and the Pines twins. Not just for the in-show characters, but for us as the viewer. We don't actually know everything about Stan. We know that he's a liar and he doesn't reveal everything that he knows. You feel exactly what Dipper and Mabel feel throughout this episode. More so when Dipper finds a box stuffed to the brims of fake IDs and documentation belonging to Stan. The episode ends with the portal a mere minute away from activation as Dipper decides that Grunkle Stan cannot be trusted and commits himself to deactivating the machine. A gravity anomaly strikes and levitates everybody up in the air, leaving Mabel closest to the machine. Faced between trusting Stan or overriding the activation, Mabel throws her hands up into the air and allows herself to float away and letting the portal activate. Stating Grunkle Stan, I trust you. Admittedly, up until this point, I, I thought Mabel could be a bit much. Like, don't get me wrong, she's disgustingly adorable, and like, eight out of every ten jokes she tells lands. But every once in a while, Mabel leaned more into the cliche kid humor than any of the other characters around her. That, however completely lends itself to the few times in the series where Mabel has to be absolutely no-nonsense. This particular episode being my favorite example of that. Mabel was previously thought to be sort of incapable of making a mature decision. To see her give in and take a gamble with her choice is honestly kind of heartbreaking. And had this been Dipper, who's obviously known to be the more serious one throughout the show's run, I really don't think they could have sold the weight of this moment as well. So, congrats Gravity Falls, I, I was proven wrong yet again. The portal opens as the timer expires and reveals a six-fingered man who walks over and places his hand on the journal, revealing himself to be the author. The surprises don't end there though, as Stan reveals this man to be his twin brother, Stanford Pines. My jaw hit the floor, dude. I, for real. I don't know what it was that I was expecting, but it was not that. The really cool part is, is that you can see a lot of hints of this during the first season, actually. When Stan first sees the wax sculpture of himself, he freaks out, as if he's looking into a mirror. It takes him completely by surprise. When we first see him in that hidden room under the shag, you can spot a six-fingered glove sitting on one of the monitors. It's a real blink in your miss it moment. Like, you wouldn't even realize... I didn't even realize the journals had six fingers until this happened. That's really freaking cool, and I'm sure I'm missing a bunch. So if you personally have spotted any of them, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'd like to know. <laughs> J.K. Simmons, of all people, lends his voice to Stanford or Ford Pines. And it creates such a fun dynamic with the two, as no-nonsense Smart Ford relates more to Dipper while Mabel relates more to good old Grunkle Stan. As I mentioned before, Mabel gets some time to shine starting at the end of Season 1 and leading into the beginning of this season, but I think what the writers do with Dipper going into Season 2 goes very unappreciated. I really buy it when he starts transitioning into a less nervous and more confident character through Ford's teachings. I love that he and Wendy never get together, and that the show actually addresses this by opening a dialogue between the two characters in the episode into the bunker. This allows Wendy to still be a participating character while allowing Dipper to solely focus on the mystery at hand going forward throughout the rest of the season. Taking away his distractions and actually having a resolution to the Wendy love plot was a really nice touch in my opinion. There are so many great intricacies like this strewn throughout Season 2. In Society of the Blind Eye, we find out that McGucket isn't just some crazy old backwards hillbilly, but he actually used to be Ford's assistant before being deemed to insanity by some of the experiments he saw. I love Gideon slowly working his way back into the fold through Bud while he sits and rots in a jail cell. I just can't get over how good this show does, well, everything. 
Before we talk finale, I would really like to point out the strengths of the show just one more time. Not only is it a masterful crossbreed of everything I loved about shows like Courage the Cowardly Dog, with the modern wackiness of a show like regular show, but the way that it actually balances all these things is such an impressive feat. In my opinion, Gravity Falls is basically a mixture of three subgenres. Supernatural slash paranormal material, lighthearted slash weird humorous material, and spooky slash mysterious material. If you've never seen this show and want to check out a few episodes, here are some examples of where they perfectly deliver on each of these scenarios. If Supernatural slash Paranormal is your game, look no further than Northwest Mansion Mystery. This episode is pure nightmare fuel, and ranks number two behind the scariest stuff I have ever seen on a kid's show, right behind the King Ramsey's Curse episode of Curse of the Cowardly Dog. Return the slab. What? Return the slab, or suffer my curse. What's your offer? If spooky slash mysterious is the way you want to go with it, then look no further than scary Oki. It's a nice little piece of self-contained goodness with some stellar animation. And if you're here for the humorous slash lighthearted weird side, just do yourself a favor and check out The Time Traveler's Pig. I'm not saying that these are my all-time favorite episodes, though every single one of them is fantastic, but what I am saying is I feel like this bunch of episodes perfectly captures the spirit of this show. And now... HOLY CRAP IT IS WEIRD MAGEDDON TIME! This three-part series finale is one of the most brilliant, well-paced, smartly written, and true to its characters finale I have ever seen in my life. Following the events of Dipper and Mabel vs. the Future, Mabel is tricked into freeing Bill Cipher into the physical world, and he in turn unleashes literal hell upon Gravity Falls before kidnapping Mabel and turning Ford to stone. Bill unleashes a phenomenon he calls Weird Mageddon, opening a portal between his homeworld and Gravity Falls. And now, story time. Once upon a time, Alex Hirsch was censored by Disney for a bit where Tambry, one of Wendy's friends, holds up a flyer for a party she's having advertising that they're gonna play Spin the Bottle. However, Disney then allowed this and this and what even is that? Jesus, talk about nightmare fuel. I would have crapped my pants watching this as a child. What abominations are these? Mini heart attack aside, I love the design here. The world is exploding. Everything is on fire. People are dying. Everyone is separated and Bill has officially started his world domination. The show even goes to the trouble to alter the theme song to suit Bill better. How charming is that? Did I say charming? Because I meant terrifying. Dipper trudges on to rescue Mabel, running into Wendy and Gideon, who is now the leader of his own violent prison gang. My god, I love this show. I, I really love this show. A chase ensues towards Mabel as Seuss joins the party, and Dipper finally, after all this time, convinces Gideon to do the right thing. 
Gideon agrees and, and allows the three passage into some like weird bubble thing that Bill has Mabel locked into, and the episode closes. In part two, Dipper, Wendy, and Seuss enter a world tailor-made for Mabel by Bill, assuring that Mabel would never ever want to leave this paradise. Meanwhile, Gideon is captured by Bill, who's still throwing a raging party for the homies before setting off to conquer the rest of the world. Damn it, this is why I love this show so much. He literally goes like he they open the portal and hell comes out and He's like, we're about, we're, we've taken over Gravity Falls, it's time to take over the world, but first, we party, and like, all, you see just, you get shots of like, all these weird demonic abomination things, like drinking and partying, I'm like, okay, that's f***ing relatable. As scary and hellish as everything is right now, this is still so in line with Bill's character, whereas for any other character, this would feel completely jarring. Dipper eventually convinces Mabel to leave the fake world that Bill made for her, and our group sets off towards the Mystery Shack to check on the last survivors and save this town. The group finds Stan among those citizens, and, led by Fiddleford McGucket, because of course they are, the last hope of Gravity Falls build a giant mech to take on Bill. Through a bunch of amazing set pieces, fantastic visuals, and well-choreographed fight scenes, the group succeeds in defeating Bill and setting Ford free. And the captured town folk and the town unifying to solve this problem and rescue all of their own who got left behind is honestly really heartfelt. I know it sounds like I'm sort of glossing over the end of things here, but trust me, the Weird Mageddon arc is done so masterfully well that I would really honestly rather you just go and watch this thing rather than having me sit here and ruin such a feat of excellence that really at the end of the day can't be done justice in words, and I can't realistically sit here and show you the whole episode, because that just wouldn't work. That being said, be warned, because I am about to go into huge spoiler territory for the very end of the series here. After deceiving Bill in a way that really didn't feel like a cop-out, again, this show solves the problem of an overly powerful villain by giving him an Achilles that makes sense, and it, it works so well. You never feel like you were robbed or they pulled a win out of their butts like it feels earned and smart. Bill is finally trapped inside Stan's mind and destroyed at the cost of Stan's memories. In the legitimately tear-jerking scene, the twins beg Stan to recall someone or something with Dipper throwing out one of my favorite lines uttered in this entire show. We saved the world, but what's the point? Grunkle Stan can't remember anything. I've read some criticisms of that line as Dipper being selfish, or saying that Dipper sounded resentful and... Duh! Yeah, that's what makes that line so great. It is selfish, it is bitter, but that's exactly how a real-life 12-year-old would act. Disney has had a bit of a problem in the past writing real-feeling kids' characters. Dipper and Mabel proudly are two of their best accomplishments. Another great example is Lilo. She talks and acts like a real kid would. A real 12-year-old wouldn't give some grand monologue about the importance of sacrifice or how the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. No, they do exactly what Dipper's doing here. They would lament the fact that their uncle can't remember anything. They would lament the fact that a loved one got screwed over for the win. Stan's memories eventually return and the mayor passes the never mind all that act as the town begins its restoration. <laughs> the twins celebrate their 13th birthday, Gideon vows to be good, and immediately sends his violent prison gang that he is still running to beat up another little kid for making fun of him. Stan and Ford make good on their childhood promise of sailing the world together, and Stan makes Seuss the new owner of the Mystery Shack. And then... It's time to say goodbye. Brenda, Candy, Stan, Ford, Seuss, and Wendy accompany Mabel and Dipper to the bus stop as the summer comes to an end, and the bus arrives to take them back home. In another tear-jerking scene, Damn, Gravity Falls, that's two in quick succession, relax. Everyone says goodbye, 
and Dipper gives a very sweet monologue about their time in the town, bringing everything full circle as the credits roll and we too say goodbye. Okay, look, I'm not going to pretend like Gravity Falls is a perfect TV show. However, I'm also not going to pretend like it's not one of the best damn shows I've ever seen in my life. Age demos be damned. This thing is amazing. I thoroughly enjoyed every single moment of this show. There was very little that I had a problem with, and honestly, for me to go back and find something I had a problem with would just be nitpicky at this point. There are things you watch that have glaring flaws off the bat, but for me personally, while some people may have their issues with this here, I saw nothing in my watch through where I had to stop and question it. I loved everything here. The voice cast is an absolute powerhouse and lend their voices to some of the strongest written and well-developed characters in the history of animation. Yes, I'm serious. Again, extra special props to Hirsch, Shawl, and Van Orman, though to be completely honest, everyone here does a phenomenal job. The animation is beautiful and expressive, and the show never lets up on the steam as far as an expertly crafted mystery and vibrant, gorgeous, detailed imagery. I want more. I crave more. And at the same time, I hope they never make another episode as long as I live. Hirsch is an absolute genius because he knew exactly what he wanted to write, how to write it, and where to end it. Gravity Falls never, never overstays its welcome. And I could confidently say that even if you shoot me with a memory gun, I'm never going to forget this masterpiece. And it will always hold a very, very special place in my greasy, overfed heart. Alright everybody, I've been Fat Man. I really hope you enjoyed the video. It was a lot of fun to do. Thank you to all the new people who came through and checked out the regular show video. Uh, we got a great response from that. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, if you like this video, come on, do us a favor, huh? Share it around some! And please, sound off in the comments. I love the comment engagement we've been getting recently. What did you think of Gravity Falls? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Was it mid? Do you want more? Please don't want more. It's perfect. Leave it. And also, if you have any ideas for the next retrospective, I'm open to anything. No, I'm not. One Piece is like over a thousand episodes and somebody would troll that comment. I'm open to most things. For Zeitgeist OG, I have been Fat Man. Thank you guys very much for watching.